Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. In Unit 13, we're going to talk about models of grammar and trying to figure out how our model can be extended to languages other than English. So let's talk a little bit about our model so far. So let's think about this model. It really consists of two major parts. On one side, we have the lexicon. The lexicon is the list of information about words that's not predictable. So for every word, we have an entry, like a dictionary entry, that contains, for example, the word's pronunciation, the word's meaning, the, any morphological irregularities, and most important for us, thematic information and selectional information, the kinds of information that govern how that word is going to function in the syntax. In particular, it's going to tell you what items that word can appear with, or must appear with. The other side of the system is known as the computational system. The computational system contains all the information about how you combine words together into sentences. Um, this is uh, why it's known as the computational component, because it computes the syntax of the, of the language uh, per se. Now, the computational system has a number of parts. One part that we've explored in great depth are the X-bar rules. The X-bar rules take the, inform take the words out of the lexicon, combine them together in uh, a variety of ways, very freely. It decides what's a complement, what's a specifier, what's an adjunct. And then it creates what's known as the D structure. The D structure is essentially your complete sentence with every word in the position it would be put in by the X-bar rules according to the principles of the lexicon. Um, the D structure is evaluated. So once you create a D structure, you look to make sure that certain constraints are met. For example, the theta criterion must be bet at this level. So every DP in the structure must have a theta rule. The binding conditions must be met, although we will argue later that some binding conditions might be met later in the structure. Um, we know that the theta criterion is met at this level because it happens before we do transformations. Um, we have uh, proposed five transformations so far. Uh, the transformation uh, of expletive insertion that I just mentioned, as well as do insertion to get do support. And then we have the three movement rules, head movement, DP movement, and WH movement. So what these rules do is they change the D structure. And they change the D structure in ways that will meet constraints that hold at the S structure, or surface structure, if you like. So that includes um, constraints like the EPP, every specifier of TP must be filled, the case filter, every DP must have case, the minimal link condition, so when you create movement chains, you're only doing little hops. The WH criterion, uh, that WH words must be in the specifier of CP, etc. So uh, these constraints hold on an S structure, which is the result of these transformational rules. So when you take um, X bar rules, transformational rules, D structures and S structures, and all those constraints, that is the computational component. When you've done this, it gives you your grammaticality judgments. Be very careful, this is not a model of language production. This is a model of language knowledge. So uh, it's a mistake to think that when we talk about generating sentences and building sentences through this computational system, we're talking about what we do online as we're speaking. Because uh, we, we know from psycholinguistics, for example, that you often start sentences without knowing how they're going to end. Uh, 
So it's it, the idea that you build the whole sentence in your mind first, and then you apply transformational rules, and then you get the S structure that you check, can't really be the way in which we produce sentences. This is a model of language competence, which you'll remember from way back in Unit 1 is the goal of generative grammar. It's to explain what you know about your language, not necessarily how you produce it. You, of course, want those things to be connected to each other. You want it to be the case that um, your language knowledge is used by your language production system. Um, but that is an extra step involved. Uh, go back to chapter one if you want to remember the, the arguments for that. So this is about generating grammaticality judgments not about generating sentences. All right, let's evaluate this system as a, gra as a grammatical model as it pertains to our uh, criteria for evaluating grammars. So um, you'll recall, again, from unit one, that uh, we have three levels of grammar. We have observational, descriptive, and explanatory adequacy. So let's ask the question, is this observationally adequate? Remember that observationally adequate means it accounts for the sentences you hear out in the world, uh, the sentences you will find in corpora. Um, so it certainly um, partly does that. Uh, it accounts for much of the data you might run across in a corpus, although not all. Um, there, are, there are many parts of the grammatical system that we have not talked about. Uh, for example, we have not talked about cases of ellipsis where you leave things out. Uh, it does not account uh, for sentences we call control sentences. We're going to cover those in the uh, third part of the book on advanced topics. Um, so it partly is observational. We can ask if it's descriptive. So you remember descriptive means uh, it accounts for the data out there in the world and native speaker intuitions. Um, I think it probably does uh, better on this than, than, than you might expect. It accounts for many of the grammaticality judgments people have. Again, we haven't um, scratched the, we haven't done any more than scratch the surface of grammatical phenomena in this course so far. Um, and then finally, the, the third criterion is, is it explanatory? So um, since much of uh, the grammatical system we've been talking about is meant to be innate, and uh, so for example, built in, so for example, the X bar rules themselves are thought to be innate. The constraints like um, the case filter and um, the binding constraints are thought to be innate. They're built in. Um, that means the child doesn't have to do a lot to learn this grammatical system. Um, and then the rest of things are parameterized. So they require relatively simple uh, choices on the part of the language learner. For example, does the language put the complement to the right or to the left of the head? And if you do that, you account for a wide range of uh, word order phenomena. So because the, much of the grammar is innate and the rest is parameterized, we can answer, yes, this is an explanatory theory. Um, we, uh, but, you know, there are some issues with this system. It's quite complex. It, it has uh, two different me mechanisms for constructing sentences. It has the movement rules and it has the x-bar rules. Um, it has a whole range of different constraints like case the case theory and um, uh, theta theory and the WH criterion. Those, all those constraints um, seem to do some of the same kind of work. Um, they are about licensing structures in the system. So we might legitimately ask the question, uh, could it be simpler? 